Welcome to B2B Commerce Corner. Commerce Corner is a sub-series of the E-Commerce Edge podcast discussing all things B2B commerce through the lens of agencies, consultants, merchants, and more. Enjoy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome Rupesh Agarwal from Amla Commerce to the pod. Welcome, Rupesh. Hey, thank you, Jason. Thanks for having me today. Really excited. I know we've been trying to make this work forever, but uh, really excited to be on your podcast today. Man, I'm super happy to have you here. And look, we were shooting the breeze for 15, 20 minutes before we even started started recording. And man, our journey together, it goes back a lot of years. It goes back about 15 years, all the way back to your early your early days in Xeon Solutions and building this solution practice, this e-commerce and digital agency practice. And there's not that many of us in this industry that have that multi-decade pedigree, is there? No. You and I and a few others, we are the rare entities, right? Look, e-commerce was invented when we were right, all, all of us were getting graduating from college. So you're getting up there, right? So my, my first job out of college was an engineer in the e-commerce team. I remember you were at Brady. Yeah. And so was your brother. He was at Brady uh, for yes. a long time. That's yep. where you cut your teeth. You were basically yep. leading up e-commerce engineering over at Brady and building out these hyper custom solutions. And, yep. and then you decided, obviously at some point you decided, geez, this is cool and I like it, but I think I want to do the agency thing. I think I want to do this for more than just one company. I think I want to build something bigger. Yeah, absolutely. The whole idea was, boy, I'm doing this for one, my, my employer. I think there's a potential because a lot of other customers and businesses need solutions like that. And there's less e-commerce engineers in the world at the time. Now there's a lot more than 20 years ago. But the whole idea was, how do we go and help more businesses and capitalize on that opportunity as a business? And I don't know if you recall, Jason, I started the e-commerce agency practice and initially it was just doing some development work on e-commerce platforms. Then we basically strategically started building out a Magento practice and we did become the largest Magento agency in the US around B2B. And, and look, in seven years, we grew to 600 employees, right? And on top of that, we partnered with your company in New Zealand and Australia and so on. And that's how we had met 15 years ago in 2010 and 11. But, but incredible journey. We went from just doing Magento to doing other platforms like Hybris and so on, Insight Commerce, which is bought by Optimizely and so on. But the whole idea was we build this, build this end-to-end from CX strategy to, to development, implementation, ongoing upkeep, and then also the, the whole marketing solutions around it, right? So we became, you were competing with Deloitte Digital and MVX. Accent, and, so, a board yeah, yeah, and, and, all those and so on. But tell you what, man, I got tired of fixing other platform problems and fixing scalability issues. And what I realized was, boy, it's the platform sales guys, they come take the order and get their DocuSign done and leave. And we at agency are the one struggling with the customer and, and putting off fires and and you can only take it for so long, right? So I thought I want to be on the other side. And then that's when the whole Xenord journey, because Xenord was a platform that we already implemented. It was one of my favorite platforms. It was simpler, it was lighter. It didn't, it was built on Microsoft technologies. So it was much, it didn't have performance problems. So I, I being young, I thought maybe I can be on the product side and build a better product, right? Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> but anyways, so long story short, that's why Great run at the agency, like I said, incredible growth, incredible reputation, incredible people, right? My team, I was so proud even today, right? And then I want to be on the product side. And here we are, seven years after that, after we started the product journey, I'm doing a podcast with you, Jason, here. And it's just, it just reminds me how much of a small world this e-commerce community is. But what impressed me right from the start in the first conversations we ever had about e-commerce was that unlike most of my other contemporaries and colleagues at the time, you started your career and cut your teeth in the world of B2B commerce. And that is very rare. That is very rare. Yes. 
And most people, they start their career in B2C, D2C, whatever, and then maybe they turn their eyes towards B2B like I did more laterally. But you really, with Brady, you started in the B2B space. And, you got it. And it's, it's, it's absolutely or, right. It's orders of magnitude more yes. complex than B2C and D2C. You learned that complexity from day one. And that's a, I think that's a unique gift that you have because of the situations that you were exposed to at Brady. Absolutely. And look, obviously, Brady was a great start for me, Jason. But because of that start, and you and I both know, every B2B scenario is a little bit unique. That there is uniqueness. And that's how I, I tell customers, it's, man, even B2B isn't generic. We have hundreds of customers on Xenor, and I couldn't tell you these two are exactly doing the same thing. There is always some uniqueness. That's how B2B is because you know, it's, it's not a consumer-driven standard Amazon-like thing. These business owners... And these businesses have been built for years and these products have been built for years and their channels, the, the way they established and do their supply chain with channels and dealers and distributors. It's like this unique mesh to everything. So what has helped us is definitely a great start with Brady. But when I started my agency in 2007, we declared we are B2B only. Wow. We, so we declared that at the time and, and which was awesome because... It actually helped us getting a fair share of attention from all our partners like a Magento. There will be a B2B customer that throw it to us because they knew we'll win, right? Yeah. Because we'll talk the language. And, and that actually helped us getting deeper and understanding all these. Again, I, I still tell you, even today, I don't know all the different uniquenesses, but definitely more than anybody else, right? Yes. It, it got us deeper and deeper in the B2B world. And I remember back in the day, you even describing to me the product configurator and the sign configurator, the custom signage configurator for safety signs and safety equipment and everything else that you had to build from scratch when you were at Brady and then how you started to build some of those default custom components out in the Magento ecosystem and then laterally in the Hybris ecosystem because I don't think necessarily we called it CPQ at the time, but certainly CPQ has become an absolute core tenant of B2B commerce today. And yes. that necessarily means very complex product configuration capability. You got it. You got it. Yes, absolutely. And just like you mentioned CPQ, absolutely. Me. We deal with all different kinds of customers. There is a local customer here in Milwaukee, and they're one of the largest plumbing manufacturer, right? So they manufacture faucets. They are the ones who invented the whole genetic water filtration system that is that was invented 150 years ago. These guys now are taking online orders. So if a hotel is coming up, they can help you design the whole bathroom and locker room and Within that locker room, how many of these general faucets need to be there based on the men's locker room capacity? The world, like there's so much uniquenesses, right? And then even beyond CPQ and, and it has to tie to ERP so that we can get the pricing and the sales rep can create a code and the dealer can basically put it in a bid, right? Because it has to go through the bid with this hotel that is being built, right? Or like an RFQ, an RFP process. RFP. So it's way beyond RFQ because it has to go through a bid process. So Xenor allows them to actually build a whole bid package that they can submit to their prospect. Wow. With like the full tech pack and the whole... You got it. Full, oh, everything. yeah, you got it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. And what, after that hiatus of three, four years, after you sold Xeon to Proficient and look, Proficient's massive, they are on the Accenture level of, of scale. After you got out of that, what made you decide, hey, I'm sure you, you probably made enough money. I don't know anything about your financials, but I assume you made some pretty good money after selling this huge agency that you'd, that you'd scraped and fought and battled for years to build into this 600 plus person business. What made you think, geez, okay, my work here is not done yet. My, my time here is not done yet. That, that made you want to leap back into product and say, geez, now I want to be on the other side of the fence and I think I can build a better mousetrap. Yeah. So Jason has sold my company when I was 36 years old. And so you're like, I don't, I don't want to just retire to a beach for the rest of my life. I didn't want to retire and my wife didn't want to see me and my kids were super young. So I couldn't leave somewhere and just be in the beach. The kids still had to go to school. No, but that was part of my master plan. I sold the agency because I wanted to build an e-com, B2B e-commerce product myself. Oh. That was a big driving factor for selling the agency. 
because I right. thought I have accumulated these 16 to 20 years of B2B e-commerce knowledge. And I always try to go fit Magento in the square peg in the round hole, you know? right? Yeah. I try to go fit all these platforms. Why not focus and work on a B2B platform? And that could yeah. be the core. So that was the idea. Again, be careful what you wish for, right? It wasn't easy, a lot of work. But the good thing is we got a great start. We, I bought Xenor, okay? Xenor already had customers, okay? And so it got me the name. It got me some customers. It got me a platform, okay? Mm -hmm. But we rewrote the entire we, we rewrote the entire software, like Magento 2.0. We wrote Xenor 2.0, right? We rewrote the entire platform with all the focus on B2B. And and look, we got some, we got lucky, we got some really good customers who knew that we know e-commerce, even though our product is new per se, Jason. And and we got some early adopters. And the rest is history. I, I tell you, first three years, I was thinking, like, why am I doing this? I could have just retired. Uh, like from the frying pan into the fire. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So be careful what you wish for. But I'm blessed that that we have an incredible product now. And and I don't even remember those 2017, 18 days when our, our first versions had launched. And we, we were dealing with early adopters and so on. Very exciting. You, your path is somewhat mirrored other players in the of, of our vintage, the likes of Yoav from Aura, he decided the same thing. After he was obviously one of the founding team members of Magento, and then when Magento finally sold, he did very well out of that, obviously, as one of the co-founders. But he was not done scratching that itch. And the same thing, he was too young to just go and retire on some beach somewhere. He was like, okay, I think I can build a better mousetrap. He started it from a slightly different angle than you, though. He came at it from the CRM position, and he realized yeah. that, hey, to do B2B right, we got to start with a CRM at, at our core to understand the customer and to understand the customer journey and to have all this data about the customer and the layers within an account and users within an account and buyers within an account and location management and all that sort of stuff. And then I, th I think he came to the pretty rapid realization, geez, okay, a CRM on its own is not going to get it done. And I'm going to need to have the commerce components as well. And that's his natural, that's his natural leaning too. And so it feels like you guys are running somewhat uh, parallel two, paths two, in that you both. Two realize. unique individuals in the world with the same cut cloth. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and it's so funny because obviously you cut your teeth on Magento as did I. And so now we're all, we're all still working within that ecosystem, but have moved on to bigger and better things <laughs> yep. in many respects. Yeah, absolutely. It's exciting. And how big now is your team now within the AMLA commerce umbrella, because you've got your product configurator platform, which is completely independent yeah, of the right. e-commerce platform. And that product configurator platform can plug into other e-commerce platforms, not just Znode. And collectively, how many team members have you got now working on these two core products? So we have 350 people total worldwide. Oh my Lord. Wow. Yes. Okay. In fact, we might be 400 now. Because we are hiring, we've got 70 open positions right now. We continue to hire every day. Even today, I was in the office and two people joined this week on Monday. So that's awesome, right? So that's good. The other cool thing is Artify is a smaller product. It's a cool, small SaaS product, okay? In total, in Artify, there's probably 40 people out of the 350. Xenor is a much bigger product, right? Yeah, it's um, an end-to-end -end product. Exactly. And the footprint of technology is wide and big. There's search built in. There's so many modules built in, PIM built in. It, it takes a shipload of people to run that. But what is exciting to us is we, you know, we're not just a headless platform. I believe headless is a fad, right? What I believe is unless you don't have heads, why are you even selling a platform? So one of the unique things we have done is we give you all these heads that are ready to go. So your web store, storefront head, your sales rep portal head, your admin head, you get all of that, Jason, right? Even though from a technology and architecture, it's microservices and headless, but we give you these pre-built heads because remember, a mid-market $100 million company or a $50 million company, they don't, they can't afford a $7 million undertaking for the next five years. And that's what when the industry says headless, that works for a $8 billion company who can afford $8 million a year with the center to keep building heads and keep writing code. It doesn't work for a 50 to 100 or $250 million company, period. It just doesn't. No. So, it, 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 so, I can agree with you. That's what I'm seeing. I see it as a fad. 
Yeah, so we are very excited with where our technology is. It's obviously built in Microsoft. Everything cloud-based. We are even moving to multi-tenant SaaS soon right. here. So taking, so that's the one of the biggest things you're going to be doing, Jason. We are taking this complex e-commerce, B2B e-commerce, and proving that we can do it as multi-tenant SaaS. You're going to be okay. the first in. Because obviously, single tenant SaaS comes with upgrade issues. Yes. And, and you got to upgrade. And, and, and all that stuff. And look, I want everything. Everyone ex expects iPhone now. Just yeah. an update comes in and it pops up. And overnight, and I wake up in the morning and I got an update. So, so to us, what we are very excited is the technology that, that we have gotten. Now we can focus on innovation, right? Because the first three years were building the product. The next three years were optimizing and selling and, and standing on the feet. And now it's just innovation every day. And I've, got, I've gained years back now because that's what we are. And, and the other cool thing is we are 100% privately owned. Nobody's telling us to do what we need to be doing from a sales perspective and valuation perspective. We just focus on two things, our product and our customers. And internally, we focus on our employees and the rest, you don't care. You know, we're going to keep, we, we don't need to answer to anybody. We're going to, you know, the ultra ultimate goal is to just keep innovating and taking care of our customers and adding new customers. The rest will be solved. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And so when it, we, would you start looking out at the landscape of commerce platforms today that say either they're B2B only or they're B2B first, whether that be Thana, whether that be Aura, whether that be whoever it might be out there. And there's some that are pure headless and there's Kibo and there's a whole bunch out there. There's commerce tools, obviously, and there, there's a lot of them. There's, there's a million Spri platforms. There's Spriker and everybody else. And so the reality is there's a million, there's a million commerce platforms out there. And I've, I've been, been lucky to feature quite a few of them on the podcast over the years as well. But would you look out there across the pantheon of other platforms that are in the market? What made you go when you first started this monster undertaking? What made you go, none of these platforms are getting it done. These platforms all have gaps that I think need to be fixed or filled or extended upon. And what made you go, geez, I know there are merchants out there that need capabilities that they really can't get anywhere else outside of massive amounts of customization. And so we want to be able to bring a tool to the market that allows them to meet their needs without investing the earth on their platform and, and massive amounts of customization, which by definition means a massive amount of technical debt, right, from day one. And so clearly you had a vision to say, look, we want to be an all-in-one B2B commerce platform that is flexible and scale enough, scalable enough that the mid-market all the way up to enterprise can use our platform. Very good question, Jason. Now, I'll give you the answer in one line. I want to be the Shopify for B2B. Yep. Very simple. Shopify has nailed it down for B2C. Yep. They have nailed it down. Yep. Okay. I started an e-commerce business. I just said, son, just go on Shopify and build your store. 100%. Me too. Okay. Mr. Customer, just, okay. So easy peasy. Now, big commerce, on the other hand, I love big commerce. I know all, all the people there and so on. They're awesome people, but they have, they also started as a B2C platform. Yes. They're trying to make it B2B, but they're not. Yes. Right. So the question is, who's going to be, who's going to win that race? Who's going to be the Shopify or B2B? That's the question that everyone needs to be asking. Mm -hmm. Who's going to capitalize on that? Who's going to make it as easy as Shopify for B2B? Yep. Now, B2B is hard because Shopify can lock you down. Hey, you just upload your catalog, you get this environment and that's it. And you got to just go with the same payment method and the same payment gateway. But there, there is no flexibility. In the B2B e-commerce world, you can do that. So it's really somebody like us, like me, who is a software engineer who knows e-commerce and who can solve that as, hey, how do we give that flexibility, but still be this pure SaaS platform? This pure multi-tenant platform so that Jason, this mid-market customer does not have to worry about features, but the biggest thing that people don't realize, and you look at any other platform, and I might be telling our secrets here, nobody wants an upgrade anymore, period. I tell my team every day, hey guys, people expect Shopify from us. Yes. Nobody, every quarter, Oro and Rupesh and Xenord and and Magento, and Optimizely, and Kivo, they all do releases of features. Mm -hmm. And you go to the webinar, 
But the customer, how does it matter? I can't yeah. get it because I'm three versions behind. Yeah. And it's going to cost me $5,000 to do an upgrade. It's basically a replatform. To to. Yeah, exactly. So to me, why did Salesforce get where it is? People, the, there shouldn't be any upgrade issues anymore. Like or that's NetSuite history. Or any of the pure SaaS platforms out there. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that, those things are history. And that's what the question is, who's going to win that race? Hey team, I have a big favor to ask you. Please pause this episode and send the link of this episode to someone you know that you think would enjoy this content. Really appreciate you spreading the word. This is how we grow. We're not a Joe Rogan. We don't have big, massive advertising budgets, but we absolutely want to grow. We want to get the learnings from all of these episodes out to as wide of an audience as possible, and we need your help to do it. Thank you, and now back to your listening. Yes. Yes, and I think that's the most important question because I think there's a number of B2B platforms out there, both in startup mode as well as some more mature platforms that are openly saying that's what they're trying to be. They are trying to be the Shopify of B2B, and it's about who's going who's gonna to get there first from a simplicity perspective, from a scalability perspective, yep. from a flexibility perspective, and also, I think, from an ecosystem perspective because that's the other thing that Shopify has in its back pocket is this ecosystem of you know 9,000 apps and 9,000 apps in their app, st app store, or 12,000, I think, was the last at last count that Harley said. And this is a monstrous ecosystem. And sure, there's arguments about some of the quality of some of those apps and the standards of, of the app ecosystem, et cetera. But even if only half of the 12,000 apps are half decent, that's still 6,000 apps that, that are out there in the world making yeah. merchants' lives easier. And so I think that they've done a good job of building a, an entire cottage industry around their platform. And I feel like that almost has to be on the radar of anybody that's trying to be the Shopify B2B, right? And I, I would say we, and in the B2B world, we can start with basics. The first yeah. thing is allowing our customers to do their complex business model uh, in a versionless platform. Yes. That's the first thing. Yes, I would love a marketplace, Jason. But first, we got to let them do all their complex business models in this thing. Because yes, yes, those 12,000 apps are awesome, but those things apply to B2C. They do come in handy for B2B, but if I'm a $100 million manufacturing, I am. I've got a business that, that does $100 million and is a manufacturer. I am never buying a platform that I have to upgrade anymore. Of course. And I, 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 why did Shopify become successful? Because they locked it down and, and, and they said, Jason, this is what you're going to get. But you, so you chose like it, to with another that plan. versus something else that you have to build upon. Make sense? So I think from my perspective, mid-market customers are willing to accept some limitations. And that's what I would coach. Like, hey, accept some limitations, but don't accept a, a platform that needs to be upgraded. Yes. Yes. If there's a trade-off to be made, a trade-off on the functionality but go with the multi-tenant SaaS that there's, you never have to worry about version control ever again. Exactly, exactly. And how do you think it's going to go? Because there's rumors uh, circulating in the marketplace that Shopify has spent something like $650 million the last 18 months on their B2B efforts and building out B2B on Shopify Plus, building out some core. They, they've built out some basic, when we think of the data primitives that are required in the B2B world, the concept of an account, the concept of users within an account, the concept of priced lists and unique catalogs and unique MOQs and buying increments and all those other things, they're dipping their toes. I would say they're dipping their toes in, in the water of B2B, right? You can only get that if you're on Shopify Plus for a start off. And for two, there's still some glaring holes in that functionality, although they, they say they're rushing to close those gaps as fast as they possibly can, as well as I do, that that the, the whole idea behind Shopify was to help retailers do retail better. They call, in fact, they used to call it the retail operating system. That's what they used to call Shopify, right? Now they've pivoted away and they, they don't use that term as much anymore. But clearly, when we think about Shopify Pause, when we think about Shopify Web, when we think about the direction that they're going with payments and Shop Pay, and when we think about with the Shop App, etc., they, the vast majority of their resources, not 100%, but certainly the vast majority of their resources are focused on the B2C and DTC world. And when over 70% of their revenue and profits come from payments, they're basically a payments company masquerading as an e-commerce platform. That's the truth of it. And so yes. when you start to think of Shopify from a competitive landscape perspective, does it give you pause at all? Or are you thinking, no, I'm not worried about them? 
I am not at all worried about Shopify because I'll tell you a few things. One, they're going to soon realize that they need to focus on their core. Why didn't Amazon is the number one e-commerce company in the world, right? They're the, why aren't they in the platform business? Why aren't yeah. they doing? Because, because you can't do everything, right? Yeah. Shopify should say, how do we take the 70% of the customers that make even life better for them? They got enough things to do. Everyone yeah. has enough <laughs> things to do. So to me... Trying to create a revenue model. Magento tried to do that. Everyone, they saw this B2B word and they say, how do we get our share? And everyone just ran behind it. And then, and they leave their focus, right? Yes. And they become the same thing then. Then Shopify, then, then a competitor, an innovative competitor is going to come and eat Shopify's lunch on B2C. And then they're going to realize that and then they're going to come back to that. So to me, Shopify doesn't scare me at all. Okay. And I'll tell you, Jason, B2B is not just account and users, price lists, and quotes, and this thing. B2B is serving unique business models. Yes. Every B2B is unique. That's what, so, so how do you build a platform that allows that flexibility? So that Jason, whose dad built this 100-year-old company three generations ago, they do these things very unique way. And that's why they have these resellers and distributors who work with them in this unique way. You got to understand that. And now you got to fit it in a business in the e-commerce platform, right? Yeah. So where I was going to that with is this e-commerce platform who, who tries to solve B2B, like what Shopify has solved for B2C, it has to be incredibly flexible. Okay. You have to allow customizations, period. Now, the question is, how do you figure that out in a multi-tenant SaaS? And that's what it's going to require. It's, when you see a CRM like Salesforce.com, you don't need a special front end for customers. It's for internal users. It's for internal sales reps, right? Very easy to do multi-tenant SaaS, right? Shopify, when you lock down a B2C capability, very easy to do multi-tenant SaaS. When it's B2B, everything is unique. You're learning new things on every customer. Yeah. Look, I'm on sales calls with my teams and there's not a week where I don't learn one new thing because that's what it is. So these manufacturers and extraordinarily large distributors or master distributors, they have their own unique way of doing business. Yeah, so, it's, it's so that's, pretty phenomenal. So, so no, I'm not at all scared. And quite honestly, in the B2B world, it, it, it won't even just be one platform. Because there are so many unique business models in B2B world, that there, are, there, are, there is enough for everyone. Everyone needs to focus in, in, in a path and help the customers that they have, they make the platform sustainable for them. There's enough business out there for everyone. Yeah, if you look at the data from DC360 and various other sources, the reality is they're saying that B2B is going to grow, B2B e-commerce in particular is going to grow at 10 times the rate of B2C and D2C, 10 times yes. the rate plus between yes. now and 2030. And when we look at the fact that B2B, most B2B brands are 10 to 15 years behind the B2C and D2C world when it comes to self-serve e-commerce, sure, they might do they might do EDI, sure, they might do e-procurement, sure, they might do punch out, but they don't necessarily do self-service e-commerce or even self-service digital services through a web portal outside of the transaction. And so not only is the existing B2B world miles behind, but then when we look at all the new B2B brands that are going to come to market, manufacturers, wholesalers, distributors over the next between now and 2030, for example, and they're all going to be digital natives, right? That's the thing. The, is yes. any new B2B brand that starts up today, they're going to start with digital at their core and it's forcing and it's pushing a tremendous amount of pressure on those legacy B2B brands that don't do self-service e-commerce. So the amount of opportunity that's going to come into our world over the next decade is going to be, it's going to be crazy and it's going to, it's going to far outstrip, outstrip the B2C and D2C opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And I, and I, I don't, mean, obviously, obviously that was your business case. That was your business yes. case when you decided to do what you did. Yeah. I don't lose sleep over what competitors are doing. I lose sleep over how do we innovate more? And how do you, so you're like the chief product officer. You're obviously the CEO as well. So you're running the company, but I'm guessing that product innovation, leading the team, being the visionary, like that's like your daily world. Yes. Yes. Look, I've got incredible people. I have people who have worked for me for 18 years. And even though I'm the CEO, Quite honestly, most of my team members are self-sufficient, Jason. 
I probably spent 10% of my day doing my CEO job because I've got very solid people who have worked with me, who have worked in the e-commerce space and so on. So my CEO job is actually very easy. You know, my chief product officer job is needs what keeps me up in the night, making sure like we are constantly delivering features. We are constantly thinking about the future and so on. So the CEO job is actually very easy for me. I could do that while sleeping. Wow. That's so and, cool. And That's people so cool. like Tom who are incredible in strategy and so on. So I'm in a good place that way. I love that. I love that. And if you were to look out in the next 18 months, what is high on your priority list, whether that be requests from customers and say, you don't do this today, but we'd love you to, or you just see gaps in the market that you go, hey, sometime in the next year to 18 months, we'd love to be doing these three things that we don't do today or that with the capabilities that we don't have today. What's really high on your radar right now from a capability and functionality perspective? Multi-tenant SaaS. Yes. Is number one. You know? Yep. And then we got to, so we, one of the capabilities that we are very proud of is our search capability. So we got to innovate way more, introduce AI in that, introduce hydrated search a lot more in there. That's our second top priority. And then the third is we're releasing our latest version with a full SPA app, React front end, and so on. That's coming out next month, actually. So we are in the midst of that. That project has been going on for almost a year and a half. As I talked about, we are headless, but with heads, right? I don't even, personally, I don't even use the word headless in my pictures because a mid-market company doesn't care what headless means and, and what it has to do, right? Well, headless well, and, is they, and they don't want to build a bespoke front end that they have to exactly. worry about the infrastructure. Exactly. For. And, and headless was a term for $8 billion companies, right? Like I said. So to me, yeah. constantly innovating our heads that we have, right? So the storefront and so on. So we got enough work to do in our hands, Jason, and that's what keeps us busy. I love it. And how do you guys make your money? You're obviously tra transitioning from a more legacy model to this uh, multi-tenant SaaS model that's in flux at the moment. Do you, do you charge a, a monthly, almost like a monthly SaaS fee, or do you charge a, an annual licensing fee? Has that changed over the years about how you go to market with your pricing? How, if a customer wants to take on board Zeno today, how do they engage with you commercially? Yeah, so it's, it's an annual licensing model. We don't charge based on like Shopify does based on revenue or big commerce. We have a, actually, we have a tiered order volume model because again, and Jason, you will be shocked. We are extraordinarily profitable company already. Wow. That's okay. amazing. I mean, that's, being, for a years. product company, that's so hard. Absolutely. I, you kill it every day. Okay. So to me, yeah, pricing is again in the B2B world. We can't really charge percentage of revenue. You can't, and that's you can't lot, because that, the you know, AOVs so. and the C, you know, and the COVs are so yeah. high uh, that so, like you're nickel and diming them. Yeah, so we've come with a pretty cool pricing model because I'll, I'll tell you, our sweet spot is fifty million to five hundred million dollar customers. Okay, because I don't want to buy a hybrid implemented juggernaut that they spent thirty million on and customized everything, and now they're expecting that in their new platform just because they're buying a new platform. Those are always tough projects for our partners. To me, I love the 50 million to $500 million companies because they get a lot of value from us. But I'll tell you, I'll give you a use case. Last week, we closed a deal. This is a $100 million company. And, and this company started from $0. And I spoke to the owner and I loved it. I don't want to charge them $3 million as 3% of sales because it's hard earned hard work for last 20 years that have gotten them from zero to hundred million. And, and believe it or not, they're on ASP.net storefront. So their technology spend right now is 50 bucks a year. And they need to get off that just from a security and all that perspective. But Jason, we can be on a percentage model because these people, uh, these are hard earned businesses, hard work businesses, and we need to come with a win price. I love the fact that you and multiple other platform vendors are doing their damnedest to democratize access to really good B2B specific commerce technology. And that's being attacked from multiple different angles today. And I love that because going back even five years ago, that wasn't the case. Even five yes. years ago, the landscape of technology that was appropriate for B2Bs to be able to use almost off the shelf 
that world did not exist. And so this is just in the span of five years, the whole entire landscape of B2B specific and B2B focused and B2B first technology has just, and that's why I got on the, the B2B train because I looked at across the consulting landscape and I was like, everybody and their dog is a B2C and D2C consultant, but there's yes. very few of us, there's very few of us out there that have the chops and the experience and the capability to consult on complex B2B use cases, complex solution architecture. Because it, in my consulting work, oftentimes I might be brought in for the e-commerce piece, but what we end up worrying about is people, process tech, data, backend systems, ERP, CRM, CDP, PIM, system integration. That's the stuff that we have to get involved in because of the fact that they think we're ready for e-commerce, but actually when we dig under the bonnet, you're not ready for e-commerce. Your data is a disaster. Your data structures are a mess. Your pricing structures and pricing models and restricted catalogs are a disaster. Sure, your sales reps are really good and you've got a lot of institutional knowledge in the business that papers over these gaps in your data sets but we got to get you fit for commerce we got to get you ready we got to get the back office we, we don't want to build on quicksand we want to build on bedrock and in order to get that in order to get that back office system ready we're gonna have to do some work we're gonna have to do some legwork before we ever start thinking about the technology or the ux ui on the front end we got to get this stuff ready in the back end. And I'm sure that you deal with this a lot too, because it, it, you, you might bring the best B2B platform to market you possibly can at the most affordable price. But if their back office is a disaster, you ain't going nowhere. Absolutely, man. You got it right, man. This is, yes, absolutely, sir. With these B2B brands, almost all of them have a, an ERP is the beating heart of their business. And so yeah. we get to get in there and we get to dig under the bonnet. But one of the things I do, one of the first things I do when I get in there and I start working with a new business is give me a sample of your product data. Give me a cross section of sample and export of your product data from wherever yeah. you got it. And give me an export of your customer data and your pricing data. And let's start there because this starts to, no matter what they might say, I tell you, that starts to reveal the really challenging gaps in the business right from the first day. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Say, no, absolutely. Which is why I guess you, you decided to put a PIM, a lightweight PIM and other functionality in the platform because you're going, these guys that have relied on their ERP for absolutely everything up till now, that's not going to get it done in the e-commerce world. Yeah. And like I told you again, $50 million to $500 million companies, a $100 million company can only buy so many tools. Yes. They're not going to go and spend $250,000 a year on a PIM. Exactly. So to me, how do we solve it for them? Yes. Yes. So you want to be, you want to be as much of a all in one ecosystem for their B2B commerce needs yes. as possible. Yes. I love that. I absolutely love that. Listen, mate, I will put your contact details on LinkedIn. I'll drop the link into the show notes. I will drop the link to, to Znote into the show notes as well as Amla. Other than that, how do you like people to reach out to you if they want to talk about B2B e-commerce, if they want to talk to you about platforms, technologies, challenges, opportunities in the B2B world? How do you like people to get out, get a hold of you? They can contact me. I'm assuming going to put my email address, rupeshanamla.io. That's the most easiest way. Look, I'm an e-commerce junkie. I, I can talk B2B e-commerce while sleeping. And look, even though I'm the chief product officer for Amla Commerce and Zenod, I am very happy to just talk to people and guide them and so on. We are a customer-driven organization, not a sales-driven organization. Jason. I love that. I, I absolutely yeah. love it. Now, listen, I've had a fantastic conversation and nearly an hour has raced by. Now, as we come down to the end of our time together, I get to flip the script, hand the microphone over to you, let you ask me one question, any question you'd like, can be personal or professional. So, Rupesh, from Zenode and Amla, what is your question for me today? So, Jason, you now have been doing hundreds of these podcasts, right? If there was one thing you had to tell a B2B prospect right? What is the one line you tell them? I usually tell them that it will be simultaneously vastly harder and vastly easier than you could possibly imagine. The technology is now better than it's ever been. The opportunity is now bigger than it's ever been, but it will require transformation of your organization in ways that you may not be ready to transform just yet. And okay. it's in B2B, it's a top down and bottom up digital transformation requirement. That makes sense. That makes sense. In fact, I had the same conversation yesterday with one of our customers and this prospect wants to buy Zenode and buy us. And one of the cool things I do is say, 
Are you ready for this? Because I, I engage and I gauge where the organization is because look, I ran an agency in the past. The last thing I want to do is sell somebody a square peg for a round hole. So it's, it works out great. So perfect. Thank you. Thank you for letting the customers know that it, it's like a merit. You, you'll have to make it work. Oh, yeah. You're in this for the long haul. This is not a one and done project. This exactly. is a program of work that will never end. Sure, exactly. there will be an upfront piece that gets you live with an MVP or whatever it might be, but this is not a one and done project. This is something you're going to have to devote resources to. It's not just money. It's time. It's people. It's capability. It's skills development. It's enablement. It's partnership. It's There's so much to this. And you know, you if you really want to do this, you better buckle up and, and embrace all that it's going to be because it's going to be it's going to be a wild ride. It's going to be a fun one, but it's going to be a wild ride. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Listen, my friend, this has been a fantastic conversation. I, I, I can't believe that it took us so long to put this together. I think we've been I think we've been trying to do this for over a year at least now. Yeah, make this conversation happened. And man, I it is so good to see your face and hear your voice and to have these amazing conversations. I really appreciate your time and I can't wait to speak to you again soon, my friend. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Really appreciate it, man. Are you a B2B or D2C e-commerce merchant? Then head over to greenwoodconsulting.net to learn how we can help you scale your business.